study hour. We're in the old 38th chapter, and um, I thought we had gotten Jeremiah out of the well, but I see I like one more verse, and, or I would not have left him in from the last uh, telecast, certainly. But that's well enough to know that Jeremiah this time, God always takes care of his own, and Jeremiah throw on, cast into this well because Zedekiah didn't have the courage to stand up against his own princes, that's to say his own family, uh, allowed him to be cast into this old cistern. Uh, call it a dungeon, the word in the Hebrew, the bore. So, but let it be a, a lesson and even make it a mindset. God takes care of of his own. Now sometimes it, for a person not learned in the ways of God might wonder, well how could that possibly be that God taking care of his own? Don't worry, he does. Okay, with that thought in mind, let's ask a word of wisdom. Let's get back to 38, 13 in this great book of Jeremiah. Let's go with it. Let's see how God takes care of his own. So they drew up Jeremiah with cords and took him up out of the dungeon, or in the Hebrew, the boar, it was a cistern, and Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. God delivered him through the hand of Ebedmelech, that's to say the king's servant, a, um, a eunuch from Ethiopia that had the courage to stand up to the king and kind of shame him. You know, say, hey, let's, this is not right what you're doing concerning Jeremiah. There could have even have been a danger that his head would be lopped off. But he still stood up for what was right. God uses whom he will. Okay, let's go right on with verse 14. Then Zedekiah the king sent and took Jeremiah the prophet unto him into the third entry. I repeat, the third entry that is in the house of the Lord. And the king said unto Jeremiah, I will ask thee a thing, hide nothing from me. <laughs> now, this is what you've got to realize. Here Jeremiah has soaked in mire, deep mud, to, and to a point that he was going to die if somebody didn't feed him or get him out. And now the king, the third entry means it was the most secret of secret. In other words, nobody knew he was there but probably Zedekiah and one trusted uh, servant. And he's saying again, answer me something, but don't hide anything. And he's already proven that he's not too strong a person because he turned Jeremiah over and this is the king. It was not a king that was honestly a king of Judah. He was a king of Judah appointed by the king of Babylon. All right? And uh, not the way that God would have it. So what do you do? What do you do as a Christian, and uh, amplify this to the end days, do you still stand for the truth? Is it possible that you wouldn't be quite honest if it could mean your neck? All right, see? You have to use common sense. Well, let's see how Jeremiah handled it because that's the way God expects you to. Verse 15. And then Jeremiah said unto Zedekiah, If I declare it unto thee, wilt thou not surely put me to death? Question. And if I give thee counsel, wilt thou not hearken unto me? You're not going to listen to me anyway. If I give you counsel, you're not going to listen. Well, why would Jeremiah say that? Because he hadn't to this point. Jeremiah warned him time after time what the father was going to do. He just wouldn't listen, and yet he keeps sending for Jeremiah, saying, I won't hurt you. This is secret, just between you and I. Tell me. Well, what does Jeremiah do? 16. So Zedekiah the king swear secretly unto Jeremiah, saying, As the Lord liveth, that made us this soul. Now this is getting right down where the rubber meets the road. We're not talking about flesh. We're talking soul here. I will not put thee to death, neither will I give thee into the hand of these men that seek thy life. Well, now, he had once before, but this time he is swearing. Would he or wouldn't he? What would you do? Again, let's see what Jeremiah did. 17. Then said Jeremiah unto Zedekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel. 
if thou wilt assuredly go forth unto the king of Babylon's princes, that's to say his uh, leaders, then thy soul shall live, and this city shall not be burned with fire, and thou shalt live in thine house. In other words, you, your children, the city, if you do what God tells you to, you won't lose it. See, this is one reason that many people, uh, and God never changes, God is always the same, that people try to do things their own way and then wonder why God makes it rough for them. It isn't God that's making it rough for them. The city is going to be burned, but God has already sent word to this Zedekiah, you can save this city if you do what I tell you. So it wasn't God that caused Jerusalem to be burned. It was Zedekiah. You got it? All right, verse 18. But if thou, this is on the other hand, but if thou wilt not go forth to the king of Babylon's princes, then shall this city be given into the hand of the Chaldeans, that's to say the Babylonians, and they shall burn it with fire, and thou shalt not escape out of their hand. You're going to die, friend. That's what he's saying. Verse 19, And Zedekiah the king said unto Jeremiah, I am afraid of the Jews that are fallen to the Chaldeans. What's he talking about? Well, let's, this is, this is an improper translation. It's the children of Judah, the Judeans. I'm afraid of the Judeans that are already in captivity, lest they deliver me into their hand, and they mock me. Now, he must be sort of a prideful little fellow, because which of the Judeans are already in captivity? Well, there's Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, some very solid citizens that were taken in the first siege, and this dude, Zedekiah, is worried about being mocked by them. Like, well, we told you, in other words, following Jeremiah's teaching, mocked in the sense that they would say, you should have given yourself over to the king of Babylon because we told you in the beginning that it was God's will and it was going to happen that way. And evidently he was quite prideful because he certainly did not wish to be mocked. Listen to me. Self-pride. There's a lesson in this for you. Now listen. Self-pride can cause you a great deal of pain with our Father. And it, what does it matter what people think? I assure you, if I worried about what people think, I probably wouldn't teach God's Word uh, as boldly as I do. I'd probably be softening things up where by it would be pliable that even the fluffy duffs wouldn't be ruffled by it. Well, I don't worry about fluffy duffs. I could care less what they think. And you'd better come off of it if you try to think. Now, I'm not saying you should go around abusing people or, or um, deliberately offending people for the sake of offending. But that you should never do. But teach God's Word as it's written, and I don't care who it offends, they need to be defend, offended and should be. It's exactly how it, that's how the rubber meets the road. And we get, we get this business of, well, oh, dear brother, to be a man of God, you have to be a gentle soul. Yeah, like Ezra that jerked a guy bald-headed because he went against Ezra's way of teaching and insisted on going the other, a real saintly type fellow, you know. Never worry a great deal about what the fluffs might think. They don't amount to anything anyway, all right? Stay on the straight and narrow with God's Word. Teach it like it is. It'll sting you just like it does everybody else. But here this dude, Zedekiah, is worried about what people might say if he goes on to Babylon. Verse 20. But Jeremiah said, They shall not deliver thee. Obey, I beseech thee, the voice of the Lord, which I speak unto thee, so it shall be well unto thee, and thou soul shall live. In other words, they're not going to treat you that way, Zedekiah. Obey God's word. I promise you they're not going to mock you. Certainly Shadrach, Meshach, and 
Bendigo, nor Daniel, nor any of the rest of them would have made light of this king, all right? Because they understood. Verse 21. But if thou refuse to go forth, this is the word that the Lord hath showed me. This is what's going to happen to you. 22. And behold, all the women that are left in the king of Judah's house, that's Zedekiah himself, it's his house, that means his own wife, his handmaids, all of his own women folk, shall be brought forth to the king of Babylon's princes, and those women shall say, thy friends, meaning like Egypt as an example, have set thee on and have prevailed against thee. Thy feet are sunk in the mire, and they are turned away back. Uh, in other words, um, if, um, if you don't do what God tells you to, you don't have to worry about Daniel and the rest of them mocking you. Your own women are going to mock you and make light of you as though you are nothing and say you listen to the wrong friends. In other words, it's your own house that's going to make light of you. And it causes one to look forward onto that time when the rapture doctrine leads many people into this same fix. And they begin to turn on their ministers saying, why did you teach us those things when it wasn't in God's plan at all? And the mocking and the scourging from within, that we were not going to participate in it. But the king of Babylon is coming. We, it is our we are obligated to stand against him, to stand up and allow God to speak through us as it is written in Mark 13. That is God's plan, whereas many of them will be following him, thinking he is Christ, come to fly him away. You see, their super preachers have told them, don't worry, you don't have to understand Revelation, you're going to be gone. They'll turn on those super preachers and there'll be much gnashing of teeth verse, over the rapture doctrine. Verse 23. So they shall bring out all the wives and thy children to the Chaldeans, that's to say to the Babylonians, and thou shalt not escape out of their hand, but shall be taken by the hand of the king of Babylon, and thou shalt cause this city to be burned with fire. Boy, that's pretty tough, you know? Take your own wives and kids. It'll, it'll be worse than that in a the moment. They'll kill him. They'll kill his own sons and children right in front of him. What's well, hard? Well, mean Babylonians. Don't blame it on the Babylonians. Put the blame where it belongs. Zedekiah. If he had obeyed the word of God, his children would have lived. His wives would not have mocked him. Let him suffer, all right? He did it to himself and to his own family. That's what happens when you do not listen to your father. Verse 24. Then said Zedekiah unto Jeremiah, Let no man know of these words, and thou shalt not die. In other words, don't... T if any of the princes come asking you, don't tell them what you said to me. Verse 25, but if the princes hear that I have talked with thee, and they come unto thee, and say unto thee, declare unto us now what thou hast said unto the king, hide it not from us, and we will not put thee to death also what the king said unto thee. Tell us what happened in that secret chamber. We'll promise you anything. Verse 26, Zedekiah continuing his instructions. Then thou shalt say unto them, I presented my supplication before the king that he would not cause me to return to uh, Joe Nathan's house to die there. In other words, give him part of the truth because that's what he was doing. He was giving him his uh, part freedom, all right? Verse 27, 
Then came all the princes unto Jeremiah, sure enough, Zedekiah knew it would happen, and asked him, and he told them according to all those, these words that the king had commanded, so that, so they left off speaking with him, for the matter was not perceived. In other words, it was kept secret. Strange person, Zedekiah, wanting to keep his word, but still you see the very small person that dwells within the kingship at this time. And he's afraid of those underlings that are under him, that he would be afraid of what they might do, countermanding or disobeying his orders, and yet he certainly doesn't worry a great deal about obeying God's orders. Verse 28, so Jeremiah abode in the court of the prison until the day that Jerusalem was taken, and he was there when Jerusalem was taken. God takes care of his own. Do you know that the enemy themselves will take care of Jeremiah? And yes, it was Zedekiah's sons that were killed, not his daughters. And Jeremiah will take care of them. There's a place in Egypt where Jeremiah will take these daughters and there is an inscription on a, a ancient door there. You have seen it in, um, in the certain documentaries that we have of that Hebrew writing, the daughters of Judah, written on that door, no doubt where Jeremiah and these daughters stayed. Uh, that's not, uh, that's not uh, recorded in God's word because it happened after that fact, but it is recorded in history which you're supposed to know and be familiar with. God takes care of his own. Jeremiah, one out of the entire city that probably um, would have, in as much as he was saying that they did not wish to hear, was, it was a very probable thing that he would have been killed there. But not probable when a whole city is against you, if God is, because God takes care of his own. Point made, chapter 39, verse 1. We're going, the city is being, or is that we're in the process now of the captivity. Chapter 39, verse 1 reads, In the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, you see we've moved along, in, in the tenth month came Nebuchadnezzar, which is Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army against Jerusalem, and they besieged it. Verse 2, and in the 11th year, that's two years later. So you can see there was quite a, quite a fracas here. And in the 11th year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, the ninth day of the month, the city was broken up. It fell. How many tears were shed? How many fears? And it came to pass exactly as Jeremiah said it would because Zedekiah the king was not man enough to command when command was given to him. Verse 3, And all the princes of the king of Babylon came in and sat in the middle gate. Even Nergalshereza, uh, that's to say the prince of fire. We got a sedan here, okay? The prince of fire. Uh, Sam Gar Nebo, that's to say the sword of Nebo, all right? Uh, Sar Shechem, uh, the prince of uh, Rabsaras, that's to say chief to, uh, to um, the same, and Nergal Sherezer, that's that, that prince of fire, Reb Mag, that's, that would be one of the Magi's, with all the residue of the princes of the king of Babylon. There you got it. All laid out, city fallen, four. And it came to pass that when Zedekiah the king of Judah saw them and all the men of war, then they fled and went forth out of the city by night by the way of the king's garden but the gate betwixt the two walls, by the gate betwixt the two walls, and he went out the way of the plain. He took off in the night. I mean, he, it was too late to give himself over. The city was destroyed. So he ran for it. Still, 
taking things into his own hands. Man is a strange creature, actually. How many people today, if they had a direct message from God through a qualified prophet, a qualified, let's use the term, a proven prophet, and still to the last breath insist on doing it his way, prideful, uh, afraid of his own shadow, no doubt, fear. Uh, a hero dies one death. A coward dies a thousand deaths. A coward lives in fear. Verse 5. But the, Chaldean arm, the Chaldeans' army pursued after them. We're going to let him get away. And overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. And when they had taken him, they brought him up to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, to Ribla, in the land of Hamath. That's Kenite land, quite frankly. Hamath was one of the fathers of the Kenites, where he gave judgment upon him. In other words, Zedekiah is just the same as saying, God may think I'm going into captivity. I'm out of here, man. I'm on the road again. He should have known when he took his first step, God had spoken. You're going to die if you don't do it my way. He still contends to the last breath. Well, here he is at the judgment, if you would, of the king of Babylon. And this is what happens to them. Six. Then the king of Babylon slew the sons of Zedekiah in Riblah, before his eyes, also the king of Babylon slew all the nobles of Judah. Now these, I, I, I must tell you that the true nobles were already in captivity, basically. I'm talking about Daniel and Shadrach and the rest. Those that were obedient to God, these were basically would-be nobles. In other words, they were the stragglers and the scroungers and uh, here that we're near Hemath, there possibly even are some Kenite stragglers uh, mixed up within this. So we're not talking about the cream of the crop, in other words, okay? He killed them, verse 7. Moreover, he put out Zedekiah's eyes and bound him with chains to carry him to Babylon. Now here we got an old boy, talk about his old lady folk mocking him and making light of him. After he had witnessed the death of his own sons and princes, these boys he had been fighting to keep Jeremiah out of their hands, they're the ones that ended up dead, <clears throat> gouged his eyes out and then put him in fretters. He's chained and he's marching like a dog, an animal he's marching, no dignity. Talk about the scourge of the land. What king? We got, now there is more to this. He was blind spiritually. He was totally blind spiritually. He could not see the hand of God or he could not trust God enough to know that if it had been done God's way, many more people would have seen the light, would have seen the love of our Father, but oh no, he's got to do it his way, and he ends up causing a great deal of bloodshed. No, the king of Babylon, in his judgment, is not the one marked guilty in God's book for having brought about the death of Zedekiah's sons or the gouging out of Zedekiah's eyes. Zedekiah did it. It was his fault, not the king of Babylon's fault. In other words, disobeying God caused it. Now we have people that are handicapped uh, or they are called handicapped. I've seen many people that have no sight and are blind that I would question whether they were handicapped because they're sharp, alert, their senses other than sight are magnified and they're blessed, but they still see spiritually a lot more than some other people can. 
So you see, he was blind spiritually, and now he was blind physically. And he is the one that is guilty. It is he that brought it to pass. So he's on his road to Babylon. And I'm sure what went through his mind would be if I had only listened. All right, now let's go to the next verse, if we may. And the Chaldeans burned the king's house and the houses of the people with fire break down and break down the walls of Jerusalem. God's word coming to pass exactly. Nine, then Nebuzaradan, this is, uh, this is the lieutenant general, let's call him, the captain of the guard carried away captive into Babylon the remnant of the people that remained in the city and those that fell away. That's the, this is a nice way of saying those that deserted. He picked them up too. They fell to him with the rest of the people that remained. In other words, they were cleaning up a uh, uh, mop-up operation of straggling troops, deserters, and so forth. In other words, we're not talking about, again, the cream of the crop, okay? Verse 10. But uh, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, left of the poor pe of the people, which had nothing in the land of Judah, and gave them vineyards and fields at the same time. In other words, in the takeover, the people that were humble, probably servants in part, good people, ended up owning everything. So Zedekiah accomplished a great deal in disobeying God. The meek shall inherit the earth. That's what the prophetic uh, utterance is here, and it's exactly true. The humble shall inherit the earth. That's God's way. Humble and meek means humble and meek before God, meaning the better servants of God inherit the earth, and that's exactly as it should be, will be. It is written, it shall come to pass. Okay, verse 11. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, which is to say Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, gave charge concerning Jeremiah to Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, saying, you think Jeremiah was worried? I mean, the same guy that slew all of Zedekiah's sons, gouged out the eyes of Zedekiah, got him in chains, and they're marching. What's he going to do now to Jeremiah? Verse 12. This is instructions. Take him and look well to him and do him no harm, but do unto him even as he shall say unto thee. And it would be here that Jeremiah would take the tender twigs as it is written, which would be Zedekiah's daughters. Do you understand by obeying God, he said, allow this man to give you orders. Allow Jeremiah to give you the orders as to what shall happen to him. You see, God takes care of his own if you obey him. When the chips were down, no one would listen to the real word. Then when the enemy finally comes, the king of Babylon says, treat him well. Now, as the king of, I'm, I'm moving to the futurist sense now, and this is important. It applies to you. The king of Babylon respects those that stand against him. It doesn't mean he loves you, and it doesn't mean he will get you, he'll get to you every time he has an opportunity. But it is just, um, you might call it honor among thieves. There is an honor there. It exists today among small petty thievery or mass. There is a respect of a qualified opponent that always stands. Nebuchadnezzar respected Jeremiah, though he believed totally different. Uh, he was a follower of Nebo, the god of learning, uh, and um, where Jeremiah was a, got, followed the, the living God. And quite frankly, 
Um, perhaps this would be a digression, but Nebuchadnezzar will be converted to worshiping the same God that Jeremiah does. Maybe God was gracious to him for having fulfilled this duty that he placed upon him to Jeremiah. That he, he let him go. So, in the long run, what I'm saying is, is that as you are delivered up, you'll receive more respect from him, really, than those that are whoring after him, thinking he is Jesus. He didn't care about them. What's, you know, any, any thief, as I state, respects a qualified opponent. People that will fall all over him, he doesn't have any respect for them. The rebel, uh, some might say, well, uh, how do you know that? Well, it's documented in the 17th chapter of Revelation. It's made very clear there. They could care less about the great lady, uh, which was supposed to be the bride of Christ, and is whoring after the, the religious beast, which is none other than Satan, come to rapture them away. He doesn't care about them. So what, what am I saying? That God will take care of you this is the type, and this is exactly as it's written. As long as you obey God, you don't have anything to worry about. God takes care of his own. Here, the king that wanted to kill or allow Jeremiah to be killed has seen this uh, tragedy of his own family, and Jeremiah is free. Jeremiah is on the way to uh, reaching those even that all had uh, escaped to the north, the ten tribes. Verse 13. So Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, sent, and Nebuchadnezzar, Rabsaurus, he was another Magi, and um, Nergalshazar, that's to say this, this prince of fire, Remag, that's again another Mag. Magi, and all the king of Babylon's princes. 14, even they sent and took Jeremiah. They did what? They sent and took Jeremiah out of the court of the prison and committed him unto Gedaliah, the son of Ahiham, Hikem, brother, the son of Shaphan, that he should carry him home so he dwelt among the people, set free. In other words, these people treated Jeremiah better than his own people did. And do you think there's anything new under the sun, my friend? Do you know that the king of Babylon, who is about due on the scene, will speak higher of you than he will those that are deceived by him? It's true. You will be allowed to speak even before him as it is written when you're delivered up before his church, his house. And it is written in Luke 21 that when the Holy Spirit speaks through you that even the gainsayers will be convinced by what you say. That's respect. But don't ever expect your own people to respect you when you teach contrary to their traditions their church system. <gasps> oh, my. Always follow God's word, obey him, and God will take care of you. I don't care who you are. He will bless your ministry if you happen to be called to teach. You don't have to beg like they do. You don't have to go around with a poke out saying, please, I'm a poor servant of God and and if you don't help, we'll be, we'll be gone soon. Well, if you're a servant of God, he'll keep you there if you belong there. If you don't belong there, kick the dust off your feet and leave that station. You know? I mean, leave it in God's hands. Uh, that's the way I do it. And God always blesses. And thank God for that. Do it God's way. And don't worry about people. I mean, love them, teach them, help them, but don't, don't worry about pleasing the fluff. Fluff will be around for a while longer. 
And the main thing is don't become fluff with them, all right? God's people are supposed to be salt. And when salt goes into water, it makes it different. It seasons it. Don't be one of these fluff balls that is just like a little piece of fluff blowing in a water, uh, and all it does is get in the way. It doesn't change it one out. It just gets in the way, dirties it up. Be salt of the earth. And then you can call yourself a servant of God. I wish we could all do better. I wish I could do better. But at least let us do what we can do by obeying the living God. All right, bless your hearts. Jeremiah, what a prophet. God always protecting him. Okay, bless your hearts. You listen a moment, won't you please?